We've now seen that price changes give rise to both income and substitution effects. And before we go on, let me caution you about a mistake that many students, sometimes as many as half the students, make on the first exam. Suppose that we go back to the scenario. We have a consumer whose original optimal bundle is at A, and then the consumer experiences an increase in the price of good one, giving her this steeper budget constraint. Now suppose I told you that consumer's preferences were homothetic. A lot of students hear homothetic and immediately rush to the idea that they're going to have to draw a ray through the origin. And eventually they will. But when you rush, you might draw that ray through the origin through point A and say, well, since the tastes are homothetic, I'm going to end up optimizing at this point on the final budget constraint. But that wouldn't be right. If this is the new optimal bundle on the final budget, we'd have a tangency here. And if we have a tangency here, what that tells me is that the marginal rate of substitution is changing along that ray. We have a tangency with a shallow budget constraint at point A and a tangency with a steeper budget constraint at this new point. That must mean we have a different marginal rate of substitution here than we did here. But homothetic tastes are tastes where the marginal rate of substitution doesn't change along a ray from the origin. So you can't just rush and draw a ray. The only time you can apply the definition of homothetic tastes is if you see two parallel budgets in your picture. And the way to get two parallel budgets is to put in your substitution effect. Take that final budget, move it up parallel until it's tangent to that indifference curve at some point B, and then you have the point through which you're going to draw your ray through the origin. Because then you have two parallel lines, which is when you can apply the definition of homothetic tastes. The same is true for quasi-linear tastes. You wouldn't want to rush and say, well, let me draw a straight line through point A and conclude where I'm going to end up on that final budget. Because in order to apply the definition of quasi-linear tastes, you have to see two parallel budgets, so you have to do the substitution effect first. So we're almost always going to have to do that decomposition. Now there is one exception to this, but it's a strange one. Suppose that we have a good, which we're going to call a Giffen good, where we start with some original budget, we have some original optimal bundle, we experience a price increase, so increase in the price of good one, and as a result, we end up over here, at a new tangency here. That's possible. We can draw an indifference curve here that keeps going up and never crosses this indifference curve. So it could be, in principle, that we optimize here on the new budget constraint. But it's something strange that's happening. Because what it says is that we're actually going to increase our consumption of x1 as the price of x1 increases. So what we're looking at is an increase in the price of good one leading to an increase in the consumption of good one. That's what we call the strange case of Giffen goods. So a good like this is called a Giffen good. It's in principle possible, but it violates what you learned in Econ 101 as a law of downward sloping demand. We think generally demand slopes downward, which means that if prices fall, you buy more, and if prices rise, you should buy less. This is an example where that's not happening. It's actually an example where the demand curve will be upward sloping. As price increases, you consume more of the good. So how could this possibly happen? Well, let's go back to decomposing into income and substitution effects and see exactly what kind of good a given good must be. So again, we start with an original budget and with some original optimal bundle A. Then we introduce an increase in the price of good one, giving us that steeper slope. Now, if we're going to introduce a substitution effect, we have to take that final budget line and move it until it's tangent to the original indifference curve. 
the way I've drawn that here, we have drawn a small substitution effect, less substitutability than I typically draw in my graphs. So we go to point B, and that's our substitution effect. The substitution effect always says the same thing. Consume less of the good that's become more expensive and more of the good that's become cheaper. And the size of the substitution effect might be small or large depending on the degree of substitutability, but it always points in the same directions. So now we're at point B, and we know if the good was quasi-linear, we'd end up straight below. We wouldn't change our consumption of x1 as we take that compensated income away from you. And if the good was inferior, then as we take income away from you, you would consume more. Since we end up to the right of point A for a different good, we certainly end up to the right of point B, since point B lies to the left of point A. So we know that a Giffen good must be an inferior good. It has an income effect that says as we take income away from you, you consume more of the good. Except it's a really, really inferior good. It's an inferior good where the income effect doesn't just point in the opposite direction of the substitution effect. It dominates the substitution effect. So to get a Giffen good, we'd need to have the substitution effects be relatively small and then have the good be really inferior so that that income effect pushes you not just in the opposite direction of the substitution effect, but is so large that it pushes us beyond point A. So it's a, you can think of it as a really, really inferior good with a small substitution effect. The kind of inferior good where that income effect is smaller than the substitution effect and where you don't get this Giffen phenomenon, we might call a regular inferior good. A Giffen good is also an inferior good, but it's one with a really large income effect relative to the substitution effect. Now, oftentimes when students first hear of this, that an increase in the price might cause someone to consume more of a good, they think of a case like Gucci purses where there's a prestige value associated with the purse, and where an increase in the price might actually increase the prestige value of the purse. And so when the price goes up, you might buy more Gucci purses because you really value that increased prestige of the purse. That's not what a Giffen good is. In the Gucci purse case, we actually have two goods that are bundled together, the purse and the prestige value of the purse. And when the price increases, we're assuming that the prestige value increases, so the good is actually changing. It's not the same good anymore. When we're talking about a Giffen good, we're talking about a good that isn't changing, but still an increase in the price causes you to consume more. Now I give one example of this in the textbook, an example that a friend of mine in graduate school told me about. When he was young, they lived in Indiana. And Indiana, in, in Indiana, they heated their home with gasoline. But every winter, they would take an extended summer vac winter vacation to Florida. So for some extended period, they wouldn't need to heat their home. One year, the price of gasoline rose so much that they couldn't afford to go to Florida. So they stayed all winter in Indiana. And because the price of gasoline went up, on any given day, day they consumed less gasoline than they would otherwise because they conserved. They didn't heat the home as much. But because they stayed there all winter, over that period, they actually ended up consuming more gasoline than they typically would. Over the whole year, they ended up consuming more gasoline than they would because they stayed in Indiana for the winter. In that case, we have a case where there's no close substitutes for gasoline. They have to heat their home with gasoline. So the substitution effect is small. And the income effect was so big that they couldn't afford to go to Florida anymore. So here we had an example of a Giffen good. It's not that gasoline became a different good when the price increased. There was no additional prestige value. It's that the increase in the price of gasoline resulted in a small substitution effect and a large income effect in the opposite direction.